wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. This is Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show.com. Hey, we have a wonderful guest on the show today. He's an amazing, accomplished author. He's written a ton of books. We'll get into that in a second. His name is Daniel Silva, and he's written the uh, book called The Cellist, a novel. This is, uh, to my understanding, uh, number 21 of the Gabriel Allon series. Just came out on July 13th, 2021. You've probably been seeing him doing media appearances all over the place. And uh, we'll be talking to him about this wonderful new book that he's got. In the meantime, go to youtube.com, Fortress Chris Voss, hit the bell notification button, and also follow us, all our groups, all over uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, all those different places. And if you're watching us live, submit your questions. They might up on the show. Also, go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Voss, you can see all the wonderful things we're doing over there. Daniel is an accomplished author. He's got a brilliant resume in what he's done. He has been called his generation's finest writer of international intrigue and one of the greatest American spy novelists ever. Uh, compelling, compassionate, haunting, and brilliant. These are the words that he used to describe the work of award-winning number one New York Times bestselling author, Daniel Silva. Daniel, welcome to the show. We're honored to have you. Thank you so much for having me. You got it. And congratulations Thank on the new book. Thank you. Thank I you. think for those of you who don't know you, if, so let's say there's two or three people still left in the world. <laughs> how many books do you have you written? This is, if, believe it or not, 24. 24? I, wow. Yeah, I always thought four would, was a nice number. I thought, <laughs> so I could write four. If I square even four books, uh, I thought that would be a pretty good little addition to my career as a journalist. I am uh, shocked that I had not now 24 books into a career. Good for you. We're, we're about sending my book to the editors right now. So we're going through that nightmare. It's the very first one. So I'll try and catch up to you. It's going to be self-published. I couldn't okay. wait the 18 months to get it published. And, okay. and we just went the hell with it. Uh, we lost too much time with coronavirus. But congratulations on your book. And uh, give us your plugs where people can find you on the interwebs, find out more about you and order up the fine book. I am. Um, my, my website is danielsilvabooks.com. And you mm -hmm. can see information on all the books there linked through to the online retailers and you know, my, my social media feed. I'm not a big social media person. In fact, my wife is my uh, secret, my secret Twitter manager, but I, I, I do a little bit on social media. Wow. Now, so you've uh, published this book out. What made yeah. you want to write another book in this series with this person? Compulsion. Yeah. Uh, and, and I always say to, to writers, if you are wannabe writers or aspiring writers, if you don't have this insane drive where you can't not write, you should probably, you know, think about something that you do for a living. I, when I, when I finished the final corrections on, on the cellist, maybe a day or two before June 1st or somewhere, I literally started my new book the next day. Um, oh, wow. And so the way it works for me is if all things are firing, all the cylinders are firing. The next book sort of the carry around several books in my head. One usually rises up and demands to be written. And that usually happens as I'm finishing the previous book. And so as I'm finishing one book, I'm thinking about the next and I get going on it as soon as possible. Because one, one of the things I suffer from is just fiddle-itis. I will just keep working and correcting and polishing and trying to to make it, 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 it fix all the little things that bother me. And invariably, there are little things that I just can't quite get. I don't think <clears throat> the reader would never really notice them, but I just, every time I read it, I say, gosh, I wish I could do that better. And the only way for me to make that stop is to start a new book. And, and generally, if it, if it, if I really lose myself on a new project, I have to re-familiarize myself with the, the, the book that's about to be published when I'm going on tour. I really can get it out of my 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 thoughts by, by, by starting a new book. And how often do you write a new book? It's fairly frequent. I'm a once a year person. Second Tuesday of July now for 
Oh gosh, about, I have to count them out, but about 15 years I've been in that slot. It's been very successful for me. Keeping my fingers crossed, I'm, I'm hopeful of a number one book this year. I think I've had about 13 since moving to July. And so it's been very good space for me. There you go. There you go. So give us an arcing overview of the book and what it's about. Well, it um, it begins um, with a, a murder in London, an assassination. Murder, you say? A murder, you say. A, it was a difficult scene for me to write because the victim is a beloved character from the series. His name is Viktor Orlov. He's one of the original Russian oligarchs. And he left Russia in about 2000 when the new gang came to, into power and settled in London. And he's really a thorn in the side of the Kremlin. He's a dissident, he's a critic of the new regime or, or the, of the current regime. And he also saved Gabriel Alon's life once. And so when he is murdered with a nerve agent, Gabriel undertakes a, a rapid investigation of, of his death and soon finds himself in a desperate attempt to stop an attack that could plunge the United States into absolute political chaos and leave Russia unchallenged on the world stage. So it's a fast paced summer read filled with art and music and corrupt Russian oligarchs and dirty European bankers. But it deals with a, with a very important issue. And that is Russia's 20 year war on the institutions of the West and how it is using money in that war against us and how it is using money to undermine our very democracy. So would you say the the book plot and stuff that you've written in the book uh, parlays really closely with some of our current events? <laughs> Definitely. And, and which presented me a with a dilemma on January 6th. I was you know writing a book about how Russia is trying to undermine the institutions of the West and democracy as I said. And I turn on TV on January 6th about 2 in the afternoon and I see that our democracy is hanging by a thread. Yeah. That that, that a a sitting uh, president has incited, encouraged, inspired, whatever word you want to verb you want to use, his supporters to attack a co-equal branch of government in order to prevent the election from being certified. It was I was in Washington, a couple of miles from the Capitol um, in Georgetown. I was sickened by it, angered by it, horrified by it, and I. I I felt compelled to write about it. And it just did fit really in, well into what I was already working on. And so what I, I had an, a, a completely different ending planned. <laughs> and the book was due on April 1st. The first draft of the book was due on April 1st. And January 10th or 12th or so, I was look, actually looking through my, my files, uh, my old files uh, yesterday to tr try to figure out exactly when I, I started uh, changing it. But I, I rewrote a whole new ending to the book. Wow. And it incorporates not only the siege, but the, the inauguration, uh, which it, it, as bad as the siege was, okay, the, the, the capital insurrection, to me, the inauguration was worse. To have 45,000 National Guard troops and, and other security officers on the streets of Washington, the city was under virtual military occupation. And we now know that there was a ring of steel from surrounding the city. My wife uh, works for CNN and she had to go through three military checkpoints to get to the office. There were miles and miles of fences and razor wire. Every, every day when I finished writing, I would walk from Georgetown up to the Capitol as the inauguration got closer and I could see the city just tightening down. It was awful. I, I can't imagine what, what the outgoing president was thinking when he overflew the city for the last time that day. And so that is the backdrop for the, for the climax of the novel. That is crazy. So was that hard? Did you have to go back and change the the aspects of the book leading up? Oh, God. The whole, the whole front end had to be rewritten to match the new back end. It, it was difficult. There were many days where I was thinking, why on earth did you do this? What, what were you thinking? But I got it done. And as a result, I almost six months to the day after the events actually happened, I have a novel out that it's the real thing, one step removed is how I would describe it, Inauguration Day. So I incorporate all of the reality of the disputed election, the insurrection, uh, and and the inauguration, as it was with, with one edition. Ah, oh, there you go. And you won't tell us, because it's the ending? Uh, no, darn no, it. It's a pretty big twist, actually. Oh, darn it. <laughs>
All right, everyone, you're going to have to get the book to find out. There's the tease, if you will. You mentioned your wife at CNN. We've had a lot of wonderful CNN people on the show. Yeah. Uh, tell us about the cover of the book. I was on the Today Show last week, and Al Roker, old friend and an old colleague of, of my wife, and, and I was joking with him that my, that Jamie had posed for the uh, very distinctive cover of the book, which is which was, I guess I said it um too straight. So I've been cleaning that up for the last week. Uh, my wife is not the cover. Oh, the she could be though. And it's, a, it's actually a cover that was done and discarded for a, a previous book. Mm -hmm. And it has been sitting there for, I guess, three years now unused. And I've always just been crazy about it. And it, mm -hmm. and it, and it fit well with, with the book mm -hmm. and with the title and with character yeah. and it looks like a piece of pop art the way the cover designer heated up the imagery and i just i'm just crazy about it yeah did you have to change that because she wanted royalties she gets all the royalties <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but I, I saw that al roker interview and in, in your interview on salt and uh, al rokers what a gentleman i've been losing i've lost about 60 pounds so far i hope to at the end of it to look like the before and after of him and al sharpton so keep my fingers crossed but working on it 20 you've had 24 books this is 21 the series for those and, and again for the five people that don't know who uh, Gabriel is. Can, I, can you give us a little uh, flesh of the character a little bit for them? Tease the baby, something. The, the CV, the CV of Gabriel. He is the the son and grandson of two gifted and important artists, and he was supposed to be an artist himself. And in 1972, after the Munich Olympics massacre, he was recruited by Israeli intelligence to be part of what was known as Operation Wrath of God, the operation to hunt down and kill the perpetrators of the Munich mm -hmm. Olympics massacre. He was raised in a, his both his parents um, were German refugees. He was raised in a home to his first language and even the language of his dreams now remains German. Mm -hmm. um, and so he could pass as a European, as many Israelis could back then. And so that, that begins his career. He, the experience of killing six human beings at close range with a, with a small caliber Beretta pistol robs him of the ability to produce original work. Mm -hmm. He studies the craft of restoration art restoration and not surprisingly he's damn good at it mm -hmm. and he becomes a art restorer posing as an italian he adopts an italian um, identity and lives for many years in europe as an italian art restorer who is actually an israeli assassin oh, wow. uh, and that's what that's how we find gabriel and at the beginning of the series <clears throat> yeah but it's really it's really the, special forces and soldiers man they're no joke those guys are yeah. tough uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They are, unfortunately, they live in a difficult neighborhood. I, difficult neighborhood, rough neighborhood. Oh, putting and and I, I was, I spent a lot of time around Israeli soldiers and spies and government officials. And but this special operative told me one night after dinner, he says, your books are very exciting and, you, and your heroes and your characters do really dangerous things. He said, it, it is nothing compared to what our special operatives do every single night. Whoa. Uh, yeah, but it, it, this book finds Gabriel. He is the director general of Israel's secret intelligence service. I never refer to it as the Mossad. I call it the office, which is how they refer to it. A and he is nearing the end of his term as this book opens. Nice. So it's, 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 we've gone with him. We found him. Um, his, his first wife and, and his first family was destroyed in a car bombing. His, his, his son was killed. His wife was gravely wounded. And when we meet Gabriel in the first novel, he is a grieving, broken, broken, reclusive figure. And he has grown and changed and evolved significantly over the 21 books of the series. Mm -hmm. Much character in the cellist than he, than he starts. So who is the cellist? The cellist is a woman named Isabel Brenner. She's German. Her mother is a musician. She, Isabel started playing the piano at three. At eight, she picked up the, the cello, took up the cello. 17, she wins a, an important German prize. She seems destined for a career in music and decides that she doesn't have what it takes to be a, a professional musician, a soloist, to perform at that level. Uh, like many musicians, she's a, something of a math genius. She studies applied mathematics in Berlin, does an, a graduate degree, excuse me, at the London School of Economics, and gets recruited to work for 
Germany's largest bank that I call in the book Rhine Bank. She soon discovers that Rhine Bank <clears throat> is a rogue bank, that it is the dirtiest bank in the world, and that it is laundering a great deal of money for Russian oligarchs, including an oligarch who is from the inner circle of Russia's president. She leaks damaging documents to a Russian investigative reporter. One thing leads to another. Victor Orlov, who, who is a, a owner of, of a dissident Russian magazine, is murdered in London. And what Isabel Brenner soon finds herself working with Gabriel Lahn in order to save Western democracy. And this involves some other topical events that have come onto the scene, nerve agents and other such things. Do you want to give us any teasers on that? I was doing an interview with a senior, a former senior Israeli diplomat and ambassador, Michael Oren, perhaps you know the name, he's a historian. And he hit upon something in the novel that I referred to, to Russia as a nuclear armed gangster state, which is what I think it is. It, it, it is not a, a functioning government the way we think of a government. Yeah. It, it is there. It is a kleptocracy. It is there to, to, to for Putin and the men around him to control everything, to they get all the money, and they behave in uh, terribly reckless ways, as we have seen, along with, with intervening in our, in our uh, election in 2016. They've intervened and interfered in elections all across Europe, and they have carried out several high-profile assassinations. Two assassinations, one, success, uh, uh, one successful, one unsuccessful, in, in the United Kingdom with weapons of mass destruction, which is yeah. what these are. Polonium is a weapon of mass destruction. They scattered polonium all over London. Mm -hmm. And when they tried, went after Skripal a couple of years ago with Novichok, which is what I use in this book, the assassins left behind a container of Novichok in a trash can. Uh, it, poor innocent civilian, Dawn Sturgis, finds what she thinks is a bottle of perfume, puts it on her wrist, and a few days later is dead. This is the way they can uh, conduct their affairs. And that is that is the sort of the inspiration for, for, for this novel. And, and Gabriel has been tangling with these guys now for several books. I think this is the, I have a subset of the books, a sub series dealing with, and Gabriel has been one of the few people in, in the West to be going toe to toe with Putin. And so since about 2008. Nice. At least we got somebody fighting that guy. I know. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, but somebody's got to do it. And my yeah. Gabriel is the guy and yeah. they have been locked in, in quite a duel. And Russia is also just a giant gas station, really, when it comes down to it, too. It, it um, is, it is. But, but, but they have uh, incredible tech, technical capabilities, yeah. very smart people, and a willingness to behave recklessly. Uh, Tom Friedman, I think, described Vladimir Putin as the ex-boyfriend from hell. And it's a really interesting way to describe him. He just wants to be... We, we always think that each new administration thinks that they can, or they used to think that they're going to get along with Russia. You know, we're going to we're going to turn the page. We're going to push a reset button. Everything's going to be okay. It's not going to be okay uh, because Russia, Vladimir Putin doesn't want to get along with the West. He wants to destroy the West. He wants to bring us down to his level. He wants to weaken us to make sure that we pose no threat to him. His greatest fear is is what we call in in, in the uh, foreign policy business a, a color revolution that the people are going to pour into the streets like they did in ukraine and elsewhere and just take him down mm -hmm. now he has enormous force at his command that, that he can kill a lot of people if need be but but if millions upon millions of russians pour into the streets he can be brought down and that is his greatest fear Hopefully, well, something will happen. It'll be interesting. You talk a lot about dirty money, banks, yeah. of course, in the book. And this is, and we've had a few Putin biographers and, and people who talk about the finances and the people that the circle around him. This yeah. is one of the ways that they operate. And what really fascinates you about that whole process with banks and hiding money and stuff and, and you put it in your books? I guess that these bankers, wittingly or unwittingly, Perhaps they, I think it's wittingly. They are helping Russia. When you help Kremlin-connected oligarch launder his money and conceal it in the West, you are aiding and abetting this war against us. The British government put out a great report, to their credit, last year, this white paper called the Russia Report. And they had acknowledged publicly, which is quite something, that, that Russian money 
had absolutely corrupted British politics. And that, that numerous members of the House of Lords, for example, were doing business with the Russians, either openly or secretly. That Russia was interfering in British politics. That, that Russian money had turned the British financial services industry into just a giant laundromat. That, that hundreds and hundreds of people were getting rich, catering to, to these rich Russians. And they were, as I said, wittingly or unwittingly, helping these rich Russians who are invariably connected to the Kremlin do things that are wearing away, chipping away slowly but surely at our institutions. Look around you, okay? British democracy, Britain's politics are messy right now. France is really messy. Obviously in the United States, Russia intervened at many different levels in, in, in our election, but they wormed their way into the Trump campaign with money or with a promise of money. And uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee, thousand page, five volume report on, on, on the, the 2016 interference made that very clear. Paul Manafort and who his contact was and who he was making money from, Oleg Deripaska. Money helped, help was one major component of that interference. That's how they got inside that campaign. Yeah. It's been interesting, the revelations. I think there was, the, I, I don't know if this is what you're referring to too, but there was revelations that Putin had met with his people and they're, they're like green-lighted. Did yeah, you start, go, you go referring to the, the article that appeared in The Guardian mm -hmm. uh, last week, the great Luke Harding. And what Luke and his team discovered was a document and they stand by this document and they showed it to people, thought it would look very authentic. The sort of a report that was discussed, the Russian version of the National Security Council. So it's Putin and his senior intelligence officers and policymakers, in effect, green lighting the operation to, to install Donald Trump or help Donald Trump become the next president of the United States. It says in the document that they know he's mentally unstable, and that's why they want him to be the next president of the United States. And what's interesting is that, to me, is you know what? They, sure, the, the Russians, it would have been nice to get some deliverables, as we say. If, if he can withdraw the United States from NATO, which he wanted to do, that would be nice. If he can weaken NATO, that would be great. What, he, what they really wanted Donald Trump to do was was to disrupt and destabilize the U.S. political system. And what I do in this book um, is draw a, a line uh, that stretches from interference to insurrection. And I can't imagine what they were th thinking when they were watching our own people. Think of all the trillions of dollars that we spent mm -hmm. trying to protect that building and our other major infrastructure from terrorists almost 20 years mm -hmm. 9-11. Okay, remember on 9-11, the plane was headed toward that building. Yeah. We think, we assume. The lawmakers are fleeing that building because we think a, a plane is about to crash into it. And, mm -hmm. and 19 years later, almost, almost 20, they are fleeing again, but this time they're fleeing their own who are threatening to kill them. Yeah. And how did we get there? How, what happened in those intervening 10 years that, that a lot of things happened? We got hit by, we got hit on 9-11. We had the failure of the Iraq war. We had a terrible financial crisis. We have a, a global pandemic, obviously, which was, a, I think, an, an accelerant of the, of the political unrest, clearly. And we had a, a, a man in the Oval Office um, who did not want to accept the, the results of an election and hand, hand over power peacefully to his successor. He seems like a stable genius to me. <laughs> very stable genius. A very stable genius. I think I'm referencing Phil Rucker's book and Carol You are. You are. Uh, yeah. Can I tell you a funny story about that? Sure, yeah. Uh, so um, I was sitting pretty at number one on Amazon and Barnes and Noble when, when the book launched. And last Wednesday night, my wife got some excerpts from the book. She's the one who broke the story that, that General Milley, Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Board staff was so concerned by what he was seeing that he feared we were about to have a coup attempt. Yeah. We were going to have a Reichstag moment, that this was the gospel according to the Fuhrer. This is what he was seeing. And so he starts putting in place, working with other senior, the Joint Chiefs, other senior generals to put in place a plan to suppress a coup if necessary. Mm -hmm. He also vowed to, he was going to land the plane as he, how he referred to the transition of power. And he, we're going to put a ring of steel around this city and the Nazis and the brown shirts 
aren't going to get in here. And think of the language that he used. Yeah. Hitler, Reichstag, Nazis, brown shirts. Can you imagine what, what we, how far we have sunk? It, it's awful. Just watching the Confederate flag alone being in the rotunda or whatever. Yeah, that was, just... was I, I, I reference that specifically. That is a ignoble first. And, and um, I was, I did a, a program with the Smithsonian last week, hosted by uh, the great John Meacham. Perhaps he's been on the show, a historian. And, and he uh, feels, as I do, that, that the fact that the Capitol was breached it fell okay just despite the heroism of the police officers who defended it the capital did fall it did the two chambers were evacuated and the sessions were adjourned we did not certify the results on january 6th not it didn't happen until january 7th and i'm trying to be positive and hopeful great countries don't lose their capital buildings their parliament buildings to their own people i think it was a a turning point and that it's going to be very difficult for us to recover from that is my fear How, what do you think i i that was my one of the things, setups i had for you i'm very concerned as well it's the reichstag moment if i'm pronouncing that correctly you the are. beer hall the beer tavern uh, moment in germany shortly after january 6 we had ra famous radio guy tom hartman on the show uh -huh. and at the end of the show or somewhere in the show he says to me hey chris you know what they call january 6 and i go i don't know what he goes rehearsal Rehearsal. Okay, so that's what that's what the um, authors of How Democracies Die, Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt. And by the way, oh gosh, the, uh, I can't remember. Professor Snyder from, from Yale. I'm, I'm blanking on his first name. Help me. No, Timothy uh, Snyder. The, the, along with those guys, these are the three leading thinkers on how democracies die and the rise of authoritarianism. And yeah, that's what he, he would say the same thing, that, that that it was not the end, it was the beginning. It was a dress rehearsal for, for the next coup attempt. And I can't believe we're talking about this, but I, I fear that is the case. And remember, yes, sometimes we have coups in, in third world or developing countries or African countries, but, but democracies die constitutionally. Yeah. Democracies die at the ballot box. Mm -hmm. um, democracies die when they get worn down by by situations or a demagogic leader. And Hitler prevailed in that election in 1933. He was handed power by Hindenburg and von Papen. You, here, you take it. Mm -hmm. And we had the Reichstag fire. And by April, the Enabling Act had passed. And Germany was, for all intents and purposes, a totalitarian state. Yeah. So it died at the ballot box and constitutionally. Uh, yeah. wasn't Hitler didn't, he, he tried his beer hall putsch in the 20s and ended up in jail. Too bad they did keep him there a little bit long. And by 1930, April of 1933, Germany was no longer a democracy. Yeah. But that actually helped propel him, that beer hall thing, because he wrote Mein Kampf in jail and, and he became more popular from that. He, he, he did. Mm -hmm. he, yeah, the time in jail was a formative time. He came out of jail, and he was a much more dangerous figure. Yeah, I think twenty twenty two and twenty twenty four really are a dangerous, two dangerous elections for us. So that we've got to, you know, go the other way. Hopefully, we'll we've got Michael Bender on the show on Friday, and I believe yeah. we'll have Carol Lennon on again. Hopefully, with Phil for their new book. We had her on for the Secret Service book she did, Zero uh -huh. Fail, I believe, if I recall correctly. But yeah. yeah, it's just extraordinary. And if you really study history in strongmen and fascist governments, authoritarian overthrow, we're we're right on the track. We're just going right down the track, and we're not getting any better with the January Sixth Commission and this whole denial thing. And it's just we. But it, look at it this way, Daniel. You'll have another book for whatever. I, I got uh, a taste of how how divided in um, the country is. Silly me, I thought surely seeing our capital overrun by that bloodthirsty mob who are calling the police. Now, they're supposed to be the supporters of the police, the N-word over and over again, nearly beating people to death. That I thought that might be a wake-up call. Like this has all gone on just too much. Okay, mm -hmm. let, let's dial this down. Let's see if we can lower the temperature. And I think what, what they discovered is that there's a, a core of the party now. Mm -hmm. This polling, I believe, was, I'm going to reach for my book here, excuse my audio dropout. Uh, I think it was 30 American Enterprise uh, Institute poll found, I think, 
39% of Republicans support the use of violence to achieve their political goals. A friend of mine is a member of Congress, and, and I'm going to disguise the member's gender here. The member was in the member's home state, and a businessman from a prominent family gave them this member of Congress a sort of commemorative coin. And on the coin was, it was stamped point of no return. And the point of no return is a reference to the coming civil war. Oh my God. We've had a lot That's of people. Sh- yeah. Good. That's scary stuff. It is scary. We had Ruth ben on who wrote the book Strongman, and she profiled all the right-wing fascist people, Mussolini, Hitler, Duterte, Pinochet, the whole thing. And she mapped out the same patterns, Hitler, they mapped out the same patterns that they used. And we're like just right on the train tracks, like right there. And uh, you're right, the fact that they're willing to use violence. You've got the Federal Society and the Betsy DeVos Organization, Centers for National Policy, I think it is, who want a theocracy. And a lot of those 40% that you mentioned, they want a the- theocracy too. So they don't, the democracy is dead to them. And the fact that we've reached this point in America is uh, it's chilling. I should have added Ruth uh, to my list. I'm putting now we get her with, uh, she is very smart, gifted writer. She actually wrote a, a column just the other day. Mm-hmm. I can't remember which paper it was in. It's a must read about yeah. Uh, where we're headed, in her opinion. Yeah. Since we're on this topic, we'll stay on it. Uh, <laughs> I, I, we can go back are, to the book if you want. Are, there are, my wife is a reporter, as we've talked about. I, because of, of COVID, she, she goes to the office only when necessary. So I can hear her on the phone and I can hear her talking to members of Congress. And I can hear her talking to these Republicans who really wanted to vote to impeach Trump both times, but were physically afraid of his supporters. Wow. They're That's the same thing. That, afraid of their mm-hmm. their own voters. That's why the Chancellor of Germany handed power to Hitler is because he was afraid. So they Donald Trump groomed this army of white nationalist militia types. He snapped their fingers. They came, and the capital fell. And for some reason, he chickened out. I don't know. I I think he he feared arrest. The you can. Talk to Carol and Phil when you have them on about they, they've got some interesting details about what those hours were like in, in terms of his White House lawyers telling him, you could be arrested here. you got to get this under control. And I, I don't know what's to prevent us from having another act of violence like that. I can tell you that there are people in the FBI who breathe a huge sigh of relief that we got through January, excuse me, July 4th without any violence. We were anticipating some kind of violence around around Independence Day. We did have a nice march in uh, Philadelphia. Did you see those guys? I didn't. Oh my God, you missed the brown shirts and Nazis parading through Philadelphia? Which time? Openly? When? Uh, a couple of weeks ago. I missed it, yeah. I missed yeah. It. I've been writing. The- That's where we are. Uh, yeah. We have the divisions in this country are real okay they, they are real yeah. um, i call them the three r's it's race religion and real estate the the, the parties are very starkly divided a- and but that doesn't mean that russia hasn't been fanning the flames these these companies are very good at manipulating intelligence services i should say are very good at manipulating opinion on this we gave them a great weapon when we created social media Mm-hmm. Back in 100 years ago, they were trying to plant propaganda and misinformation in magazines and newspapers in the West. Now it's just a click. Yeah. And hundreds of thousands of people, you, you put out a, a, a fake news story that Hillary Clinton has AIDS and, and 300,000 people or 500,000 people view it and click it and like it just like that. They know how to spread it. They know how to get it in, in, into the into the right nodes and the right accounts to make it explode. They're very good at it. Yeah. It would have been interesting, too. Last week, we had CNN Ailey Honig on for his book, Catch It Man. And if Bill Barr decided to stand with Trump and do a seize of power, that would have been the key. That would have been one of the key uh, people to have on there. That would have been interesting. Yeah. I don't think that they... um... He, he, it wasn't hardly surprising where Donald Trump is concerned, but it really wasn't very well organized. Um, but that does not mean that there weren't, that there, there, there wasn't something afoot. A lot of us, including obviously, uh, Mark Milley, when they started putting these flunkies into senior positions yeah. at the Pentagon, and there's talk about firing the CIA director and making a, a flunky 
the CIA director. And frankly, we had two flunkies that were running the, the office of the uh, director of national intelligence for the last couple of years of the administration. These were troubling signs that something was afoot. And it, yeah. it, did come to, it did not come to fruition this time, but I, he must not run again. Yeah. President, because I'm, con I, I'm convinced that if he runs for president again, we'll have, we'll have election violence. We'll have violence during the election season. I, but I was going to make a point earlier. When my wife hears from these members, Republican members, all the time that they will use the constitutional power that they have, if necessary, to throw it into the House and choose the next president of the United States in the House of Representatives. Yeah, that's what they wanted to do. Yeah. And that's when democracy dies. That's when the country becomes ungovernable. That's when millions of people go into the streets. That's when soldiers go into the streets. It, it does not take a creative mind. It doesn't take my brain to spin mm -hmm. that out into, in a very short period of time, things could go really re sideways very quickly. And Putin wins and smiles the whole time. Oh, he's loving it. He's loving it. Do you think that if Vladimir moved into, grabbed more of Ukraine or took the whole damn thing, do you think that we're in a position to, to go, our countries, to go to war to, to, to get the Russians out of Ukraine? I don't think so. I don't think so either. If we were to suffer another catastrophic attack, could we muster the political will to unite and send a force abroad again? Um, gosh, I don't know. Yeah. And he almost doesn't have to with the sabotage they're doing with the, the ransomware hacking. They ran up gas prices, and now I see all the Trumpers running around going, Biden, raise my gas prices. I, I, I believe that was, a, I've said it publicly, I'll say it again. I believe that they are waging war on us right now with these hacks. Think of Putin as the Don, okay? So mm -hmm. he controls a neighborhood or a borough of New York City. <clears throat> you don't go commit a crime on his territory without getting permission of the Don and giving the Don his cut. Mm -hmm. That's the way it works in organized crime. It's a, at the street level. I believe that, that, that he is tacitly or actually green lighting these attacks to try to weaken Biden, to try to further divide us. And that it's part of a broader plan to just keep this pot boiling. Yeah. Um, I'll give you an example of what they so ruthlessly did a few years ago in, in Europe. So they intervened in Syria to help their friend Assad, okay? They want Assad to survive, to keep their naval base, keep their presence in the Middle East. So they start working with Assad doing really cruel, indiscriminate bombing of civilians. Remember, so that's what starts that refugee flow from Syria into Europe. That refugee flow soon starts to destabilize Europe. Russia jumps in with their bots and their social media manipulation and stirs the pot in Europe further. And then it, on the battlefield, they commit more atrocities, more indiscriminate bombing, kill more civilians, which feeds more refugees into the pipelines, which further destabilizes Germany and Europe and, and Italy. So they have, in effect, weaponized the refugee flow that they themselves created. That is how ruthless these guys are playing. That is the level, that's the three-dimensional chess that they're playing against. Yeah. Yeah, it was quite extraordinary. I think there's a term for what in Russians, what they do, where they're not really, they create chaos, but they're not like, it's not, it's just dropping bombs everywhere, basically. Right. I think there's hybrid, a term for it. Hybrid warfare. There's a wonderful documentary, the two-part, four-hour frontline documentary on, on Putin a couple of years ago. And Jake Sullivan, the current national security advisor, explained that dur during the Obama administration, they could see that the Russians were moving into Ukraine. They could see it happening, but it was all done with, you know, guys without proper uniforms. And they would tell the Russians, what the hell's going on? Nothing's going on. We're not doing anything. And Crimea falls and we couldn't do a thing about it because they're using a form of, of, of warfare. They refer to it as hybrid warfare. They're not gonna challenge us militarily directly, but they're just gonna keep these indirect attacks on us, cyber, assassinations, destabilize, destabilize. And a key part of that is funding and supporting politicians. Doesn't matter what side, left or right, who are anti-establishment, disruptive, destabilizing figures. And, and look, Steve Bannon promised that's what we were, they were gonna be. They were gonna disrupt Washington. Yeah. Take a blowtorch to the elites. They were gonna destroy the existing global economic order and the global security order. Well, who 
who might be interested in, in helping to facilitate the destruction of, of, of NATO and the global security post-war global order? Who, let's think, who might want to help them achieve that goal? And like, China. Uh, and yeah. China, Russia, most certainly. And part of it is just good old-fashioned paranoia. Weaker West and weakened NATO poses no threat to him. He can do whatever he wants in the old republics and satellites of Eastern Europe. The near abroad, as the Russians refer to it, hmm. um, he he wants his empire back. It's not going to be a, a territorial empire like it was in, in in the Soviet Union, but to be the dominant influence over all of the old Soviet republics and the old um, um, Eastern countries of Eastern Europe. It's crazy. The Warsaw Pact. Yeah. Yeah. This has been a wonderful discussion, Daniel. Let me take you back to your book so we can lead out with that. I heard you say that you have a favorite character in this book. Uh, who, who would it be? A <laughs> favorite character in the book. The Would it be the uh, name title? Uh, uh, well, I love Isabel Brenner. I think she's one of the best characters yeah. I've ever created. I did, in many respects, Isabel. I created Isabel so I could bring back a, a, a character that I've always wanted to bring back. It's a, a violinist that, who appears in, in the second Gabriel Lawn book. It has a way to, to come back onto the page in the cellist. Her name is Anna Rolf. Chapter 31 of the book is one of my favorite chapters, one of my favorite scenes I've written in a very long time. It's a reunion of, of Gabriel Lawn and Anna Rolf. I, will, I won't say it. There you go. There you go. So anything more you want to tease out or plug on the book before we go out? Uh, no. It's, as I said, it's a, it, is, it is a work of entertainment. It is fast, a relatively easy reading. It's going to take you inside the world of corrupt banking. It's going to, I'm, I'm going to do it my way. And you're not going to be wading through facts and figures. I do my banking in a very entertaining way. And you're going to learn some things about money laundering. It depends on whether you like classical music or not, but you might also learn what thing or two about classical music and art. And so I write my books in a much different way than the typical international thriller, spy thriller writer uh, does. I go about it a different way. And that's a reflection of, of Gabriel Law and the sort of two sides of his character. Have you, has Amazon or anybody approached you to make a whole series out of these? I sold it a couple of times. It is back on the block right now. And I actually, when I was in New York, I, I had a very productive meeting. I, I can't say anything about it. I'm yeah. afraid. It. But, but to quote a line from Seinfeld, the wheels are in motion. Things are there you go. I think it would make a great series. They do so much of that work now. It would indeed. There you go. There you go. Daniel, it's been wonderful to have you on the show. Give us your plug so people can find you on the interwebs and order up that great book. DanielSilvaBooks.com. It's, it's, everything is there. One word, DanielSilvaBooks.com. There you go. And, and guys, order the book wherever fine books are sold, but only go to the bookstores where the fine books are sold. And if you can, help your local bookseller. There you uh, go. They have really had to struggle mightily to make it through COVID. They had to figure out how to sell books without having anyone in the store. And all of my favorite bookstores around the country managed to come through it with some really creative, innovative things that were done on the fly. But help them if you can. Yeah, definitely. Most definitely. Support your local booksellers. Daniel, it's been wonderful to have on the show. A very insightful discussion and an honor to have you as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. There you go. And thanks, Amanis, for tuning in. Go to YouTube.com, Fortune's Chris Voss. You can see the video version of our whole discussion here. You can go to Goodreads.com, Fortune's Chris Voss. See all the books we're reading and reviewing over there. Go to all our groups, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, all those places the kids are at nowadays. We're at, so you can check out the Chris Voss show there. Thanks, Amanis, for tuning in. Uh, be sure to be good to each other, and we'll see you guys next time.